At a certain point in life, youth becomes a choice. Because there are people for whom life happens too. They spend existence in a stream of water being carried from one event to the next. Then there are those that demand to swim. James T. Kirk has swam his whole life, refusing to ever accept a no-win scenario. This carried him throughout a career in Starfleet, turning death into a fighting chance for life. But eventually, the currents of time are stronger. As the ashes of Eden opens, Kirk has capped off a 30-year career by bringing peace between the Klingons and the Federation at the Kittimer Accords. A man who was perfectly designed for one job, the captain of the Enterprise, has lived his life in that perfect moment. But now, the Enterprise was to be decommissioned. Kirk, on the verge of retirement, his crew scattered to the far stars, and his perfect life, his perfect moment that gave no thought to what happened next, was over. But at a diplomatic function, full of pomp and circumstance, a woman comes across Kirk's view. A beautiful half-Romulan, half-Klingon, from an abandoned joint colony, and she needed his help. She needed Captain Kirk of the Enterprise, because her planet holds the fountain of youth, but more than that, it holds the next step for James T. Kirk. It holds purpose. She held purpose. And in her purpose, Kirk made his choice. I had over 10 years in uniform during the global war on terror. And for me, that was just about all the adventure I ever really wanted. Because I was adjacent to enough excitement to understand that, you know, excitement, not always for me. It's not always uh, how they portray it in the movies. And I think that might be why whenever I see a military movie, I don't escape into fantasy. I plug him or her through the prism of my real life experience. And I think part of the reason I love Star Trek so much is because its creator, Gene Roddenberry, is a veteran himself. He was born in 1921 and Roddenberry would serve as a fighter pilot in World War II flying 89 combat missions. And while Starfleet, while the Enterprise itself is a space navy, you can see the real life experience, the real life combat knowledge that Roddenberry had. Starfleet feels like what a military might feel like 200 years from now, 300 years from now. Roddenberry's most important creation, the thing that he will ever be tied to, the character that forever will shape his legacy, is Captain James T. Kirk of the USS Enterprise. Kirk kept the galaxy safe for American democracy in the form of the United Federation of Planets, which was the stand-in for America, its NATO allies, and everyone else that stood against the Soviet Union in the 1960s. The Soviet Union mirrored the Klingon Empire and Star Trek itself. But on the flip side of those adventures, there's a cost. Throughout all of Captain Kirk's many travels, he has had at least one child named David Marcus by a woman named Carol Marcus. And Carol Marcus, when they were younger, when David was a baby, knew that James T. Kirk was not the sort of guy who stuck around. And so she told him 
to get lost. And she was right. Because he got lost. In an infinite world of adventure, exploring what it meant to be human, living life, being 29 years old for 30 years. And then, one day he turns 60, and he's very much alone. Because his ship is decommissioned, his crew disbanded, his career completed. James T. Kirk finds himself in the same lost malaise that all men do when they spend their lives holding on too tight to 29. When they don't prepare for the next stage of life. Or maybe he just didn't think he was going to live that long. If you spend your life a warrior and you never really think what to do when the war is over because why would you live that long? The war is forever. The Cold War is forever. The Cold War was supposed to go on forever for James T. Kirk until he made peace with the Klingons at the Kittimer Accords. And then in his malaise, after peace in our time is found, he finds himself in the bed of his old lover, his forever friend, Carol Marcus. And they both know it won't last. Because Carol has always known she's not enough to keep James T. Kirk around. And she was right. And you can see in this portrayal of Captain James T. Kirk how William Shatner wanted to inject a lot of human fallibility into the character. Where Captain Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are at a Federation function. Captain Kirk is going through this audience and is universally known throughout the cosmos as being the hero of the galaxy. There's a line in the book that sticks with me where he says, if everyone knows you, then no one knows you. If everyone's your friend, a man who has a million friends truly has none because how can you repay that burden of friendship? You can see where that idea was taken directly out of William Shatner's life. Everybody knows who William Shatner is, or at least you've heard of him. And I'm like, oh, he's he's pulling from his own experience with Star Trek to humanize and ground his most famous character. And at that party, with all those people that know him, that think they know him, he meets Tallini. And Tallini is the voice of a planet called Chal, which is a Klingon-Romulan joint colony. And she's way too young for Kirk. Kirk's 60. Tallini's north of 20, but not by very much. And he's immediately smitten with her because Kirk's going through a midlife crisis in the ashes of Eden. It's a very real, very human thing. And in his midlife crisis, Kirk agrees to go be the training captain for the Chal Defense Force. He's given the decommissioned Enterprise, which is just kind of a husk of its former self. And I really liked when they had Spock call out Kirk, where he says, she's using you and your reputation and the access that your reputation grants as a mercenary in exchange for sex because you feel useless and desperate. And it's a bridge novel. So the overall plot of there's an admiral in the Federation and he's trying to start a war with the Klingons and he doesn't like peace in our time. So he's trying to change that. It's been done. It was done in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. So they kind of rehashed the same general overarching plot from there. And Kirk and the Enterprise gang have to stop it. And the Enterprise A is destroyed at the end. And this is the bridge that takes us from Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, to Star Trek VII, Generations. Now, the next book in this series 
is a book called Star Trek The Return, where it's a sequel to Star Trek Seven Generations, where Kirk comes back and he's alive in Captain Picard's timeline in the time of the next generation and Star Trek Deep Space Nine. <laughs> opening moments of Star Trek Generations, there is a moment that defines the character arc of Captain James T. Kirk, where he and Scotty and Chekhov are getting a tour of the new USS Enterprise B. And they're feeling very old and outdated. And that's the point. They're moving on. And this grand tour is meant to be just a trip around the block. Nothing crazy, nothing exciting, but they encounter an energy ribbon called the Nexus and it damages the USS Enterprise B. And for one brief moment, the new captain, the green, fresh-faced captain is going to go down there and fix engineering all by himself and be heroic. That new captain gives James T. Kirk the con and slowly Kirk settles into the command chair, feeling all the warmth the nostalgia, the perfect moment, the perfect place that he belongs, or at least belonged, because that's not his chair. That chair belongs to the new captain, the new generation. And in that moment, he becomes a new man. In that moment, he becomes himself. In 1996, William Shatner with Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens published the second book in the Shatnerverse called Star Trek The Return. It starts two days after the end of Star Trek Generations. The Enterprise D is being stripped for parts on the surface of Viridian 3, and Spock shows up to mourn the death of his friend again. And as Spock is down at the gravesite, for James T. Kirk, as Riker is leading the dismantling team, there is an attack on the surface. And then Spock notices all of the rocks placed on Jim Kirk's grave implode, implying the body left. And so what happened was the Romulans picked up Kirk's body and brought him back to life with Borg nanotechnology. You can like bring someone back to life for like a week. And this Romulan that brought Kirk back was the granddaughter of the Romulan commander in the Balance of Terror episode. And so when they bring Kirk back to life, his mission is to kill Jean-Luc Picard and help lead a Borg invasion. There's a lot of good pieces of this book, but and I get what they're going for. I get that. Throughout this whole thing, Kirk has been told that, you know, he was married to a Romulan and the Federation killed his wife. But the middle of the book, I kept skipping large chunks of because it felt like, kind of like filler. Because there was this pattern I, I noticed kept repeating where they went down a list of next generation characters after the destruction of the Enterprise D while on vacation, running into Kirk as Kirk is hunting Picard, looking for Picard to kill Picard. And then Worf's on vacation. And then Worf meets a stranger. Worf fights the stranger. Worf barely gets away alive. Cut to Data and Geordi are on vacation. Data and Geordi meet a stranger. And then that cycle ends with Riker, and Riker manages to capture him and then figure out who he is. And a lot of that feels like filler. You know, I get what they're going for. I get they're look going for Kirk is haunting the crew of the next generation based off an idea Shatner had as per Star Trek movie memories, where he says, what if Star Trek eight was Kirk is haunting Picard? But I don't know, man, I don't like filler. And and then you have this other cool section, which I kind of think 
was a different idea they had, and they just kind of adapted it to Kirk being there, where you've got Picard and Beverly are actually on a mission to go infiltrate a Borg thing. But then Spock also infiltrates the Borg thing, and then they see each other, but they both think they've both been assimilated, but they haven't. And so there's this thing. There's a there's a bit of a, a fun subplot where they both think that the other one is the greatest threat to the Federation, which, I mean, cool. I'll buy it. And there was a really cool idea I liked in this. A really, really cool idea I liked in this. Where Picard was Locutus. Picard, Vulcan mind melded with a Spock. So part of Picard's Katra is in Spock's soul. So when the Borg try to assimilate uh, Spock, they say, oh, he's already one of us. And Spock's like, oh, cool. That's really convenient because being assimilated looks painful. And... This whole thing kind of ends with they get Kirk free of the mind control, but there's a couple of fake outs there where you think he's free, but he's not. And then then he's really free of the mind control. And then they beam down to the Borg homeworld and he throws a switch and then blows up the Borg homeworld, which is cool. They kind of bring the cowboy from the past to fight the machine, which I like. And then it ends in this cool sort of like cliffhanger where he sees a big beam of energy and he jumps into it and just says, fuck it, why not? I don't know what this is. But they explain that in the third book of the Shatnerverse called Star Trek Avenger. <laughs> Because when Kirk was a boy, he spent his youth chasing his father from post to post as a military brat. And according to Memory Alpha, by 2246, he was living on Tarsus IV, and his father, George, moved there. During his time on Tarsus IV, the planet was undergoing a food crisis that was starving the colony, which consisted of 8,000 people. Governor Kodos, sympathetic to the old eugenics philosophies and unaware that supply ships were imminent, tried to save a portion of the colony by killing 4,000 colonists he deemed least desirable or able to survive. The 13-year-old Jim Kirk was one of only nine eyewitnesses to the massacre. But in Star Trek Avenger, we learn that Spock's father, Sarek, was at the colony. And Kodos was part of a much bigger plan. In 1997, William Shatner with Judith and Garfield Reeve Stevens released the third book in their Shatnerverse saga called Star Trek Avenger. And it takes place two years after Star Trek The Return. And I enjoyed this book so much more because Star Trek Avenger is a direct sequel in many more ways to the Ashes of Eden than The Return is. Because in The Return, they don't really talk about Tallini. They don't talk about Shaw. They don't really build into this second separate canon that the Ashes of Eden began. There is a soulful melancholy at the heart of Star Trek Avenger. And it is almost a response to the Ashes of Eden, where the Ashes of Eden asked, after a 30-year career of being a soldier, what do I do now? What's my next mission? Avenger asked, what was it all for? And more importantly, was it right? Because it opens with the Federation on the verge of collapse. There is a virus called the Verogen, that is spreading from world to world. And Captain Jean-Luc Picard on the Enterprise E is having to fire on refugee ships attempting to run the blockades 
set up by Starfleet. A good man is told to make an impossible choice where he has to choose which way he fails. And as this mystery virus is spreading, Captain James T. Kirk of the USS Enterprise is slowly, surely making his way back to Chal. Because after surviving the encounter with the Borg, after escaping the destruction of the Borg homeworld, after being nursed back to health by a colony of ex-Borgs, he begins his trek back to where he last felt at home, at peace. And that was with Tallini, 80 years before. And he doesn't expect to find her. He doesn't think she's going to be alive. But the Chal have extended lifespans due to their Romulan Klingon heritage. And Tallini's there, and she's alive. But she's dying from the Verogen. But luckily, the manic pixie Dreamkirk knows just what to do to save her. A secret cure given to him by mysterious means helps reverse the dying love of his life. He takes her home. He gives the cure to Starfleet. The cure spreads, but not faster than the disease. And the disease takes on two forms. One of the virus itself that is destroying life. And the other through a radical terrorist ideology spread by Vulcan separatists who believe that the Federation will fall within 30 years if continued on its current trajectory, where the lack of biodiversity across multiple star systems encourages a famine, encourages a pandemic. And the annoying part is they're not wrong on that regard. And this plague these separatists can be traced back to Kirk's childhood, to Tarsus IV, to Governor Kodos, who was a member. And as they peel back the mystery of who the separatists are, as Kirk realizes just how much Governor Kodos was involved in those early days, he remembers his second meeting with Kodos, how Kodos was an old man, how Kodos is now reminding him of himself. Because in that soulful melancholy that Kirk is experiencing, he sees the younger Federation officers, the ones still blinded by hope and idealism, the ones that believe in restraint. And all Kirk can offer is the bitter realization of a man who spent 30 years fighting and killing to protect the Federation, to say restraint gets people killed, you must act with superior firepower and overwhelming force. And Kirk's not wrong in all situations. The lesson that Star Trek Avenger espouses is that blanket ideological answers, two-dimensional surface level answers, do not get the job done. Sometimes you need peace through superior firepower. Sometimes you need to talk about things. And that, my friends, wraps up the first trilogy in the Shatnerverse saga. And that wraps up the first installment of Book Flub. I might do another video on the second trilogy, the Mirror Universe trilogy. I haven't read them since I was a kid. And as of this recording, I'm in the middle of book five. And I'm having a good time. And I hope you are too. Nick is still lost in space and is on hiatus till January. So we'll see you next time on Book Flub. My cat is purring and licking the microphone right now. <laughs> she can see that I'm paying the microphone attention and not her and the jealousy is well it's 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 warranted anyway take 2